and welcome to the Stephanie Herman Show. Here we are today. I am delighted to be interviewing James Redford. I am calling him Jamie, and I think other people can too once they get to know his big heart. And he has done a documentary on the big picture rethinking dyslexia. And I wanted to interview him because I did a documentary on learning differences through the Charles Armstrong School and we share a passion together of our children who both had dyslexia. Jamie, thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. I look forward to learning more about the big picture, Rethinking Dyslexia, which is a HBO special and also going to be out in DVD form also. And um, I want to know more about how you came about to produce this film. Well, it's a personal project, first and foremost. My wife and I uh, you know, realized um, when my son was in about first and second grade that something wasn't quite right in the way he was reading and writing. Um, at the time, this is sort of the late 90s, there weren't some of the online resources and also there wasn't the sort of cultural shift that's taken place we feel in the last 13, 15 years that makes dyslexia a little easier to identify than it was in the late 90s. So it was a bit of a journey to figure out what was going on. Is and your wife a teacher? She is. My wife uh, has been teaching for 26 years. And as she says in the movie, because she's in the movie with my son, um, she couldn't wait to you know, be this amazing mother teacher and to use all of her best tools to help him become a great student and develop a love for reading and writing and everything else. And she hit a wall, you know, and it was mystifying. Um, but she's tenacious and we were both very concerned. Um, and it took us a while to figure it out. First it was a little processing issue or a maturity issue, he's a boy, all these sort of grumblings. But ultimately by fourth grade, um, it was clear that it was dyslexia. And um, we put him in a remedial program and, and he began to work his way back towards more reading competency and ultimately um, writing skills as well. But it is hard work and it's very difficult on young children. And it left us feeling like, boy, where was, where's the movie that, that explains this to parents and families? Where's that content that can enable you, once you have a diagnosis, to understand at least there's hope involved and there's light at the end of the tunnel and that it's a journey and that very much so Dyslexics who seem like they're really struggling as children very often end up excelling in life as adults. And you just have to be patient and understand that it's not an academic death sentence. So having that in us, uh, when I was presented the opportunity to make the film by Karen Pritzker, who's the producer and a supporter of the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, which is, by the way, one of the pre preeminent research centers for dyslexia with Dr. Sally Shaywitz, and they do an amazing job with, um, you know, uh, diagnosis and um, remediation as well. And in doing so, Karen became familiar with my work and understood that I had been doing documentaries and wondered if I could do a, um, a project with her. So mm -hmm. uh, I jumped at it. It was, you know, it's not often as a parent you're given a platform to express your feelings about something you really care about. And this was that chance. So I think a lot of times, um Parents don't even know to give the child the testing to right. find out what's going on. And I think testing is like a roadmap to understand the way a child's brain is working or where the difficulty or the differences are. And right. I think as a parent and as a child, if you know what's going on, you can then sort of, you know, guide it a little bit this way or guide it. And you can ask for help in different areas like you did with Linda Mood Bell. and. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's an important awareness for yeah, parents. It is. it is. I mean, I think the my sense is that in the long run, I think there's going to be a day in the future when we come to really understand that everybody has their own unique learning profile. I, you know, in the interest... We've, we've got our maps. Yeah. Everybody has their own unique maps. And because the education system has to take care of so many, we educate to the middle and we educate to the norm in terms of the average. But if you really look at it, there really is no average person. That's a, that's a number, right? So 
But what are we doing educating to the average? It's really about the economics and the unfortunate economics of how little resources we put towards educating our children. But I think this is, this is the problem we're in right now. I think eventually these labels around, you know, what you, how you learn, what, what are your strengths and your perceived weaknesses are going to recede. And we're just going to come to understand that learning is as specific as our fingerprints. And we're going to be able to cater to our unique way of learning. And hopefully with that, some of these stigmas around not being able to read quickly or write quickly are going to go away. Because right now, a lot of kids are burdened with feeling ashamed of their learning profile and feel like they're stupid. Or And that stays with you for a long time. It does. And it continues... Um, on into adult life. I mean, here's my son at a top-notch college doing very well. What school is he going to? He now? goes to Middlebury College. Okay. And, but he will talk very eloquently about, you know, um, even, even in college, uh, managing the way I need to study and learn versus the college environment, it's just always going to be there, you know. I think you just get good at managing it. Um, it never goes away. And I think there's, there's not necessarily entirely bad news with that because what also doesn't go away is how you think out of the box, your ability to think um, creatively. Uh, most dyslexics are very bright and once they figure out where that manifests, um, they show extraordinary capacities um, around original thinking, whether it's in medicine or literature or art or business. Um, you know, the Fortune 500 companies in this country have a large amount of dyslexics running them. And there's a reason for that, because of the way they see the big picture. And it's really great if you learn early on how your child is thinking so you can guide them in that direction, if that's the direction they're going to go into, instead of fighting. Yes. And You know, we live in a comparative society. Uh, that's such a strong thing that presses down on most parents. And you're trying to figure out, am I doing a good job? How is this going? Am I, am I touching all the bases? Is, am I forgetting anything? How is... And you look around at your community, and the tendency is to sort of try to figure out where you fit in and all that. So there's pressure to want to at least be like everybody else, which is, in the end, sort of a hopeless quest anyway, because nobody's really like anyone else. So... Um, you know, I think with dyslexia, if you can just uh, take it as actually a gift, to real, to an, early, an early awareness that we're all unique and how you deal with your kid and how you guide them towards their best selves is unique. You know, embrace that. Get through I it. I think I'm dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do be because when I read, I, I look at every word and and it like I every single word I have to be in love with till I get to the next word and it takes a long time to read and I think having a daughter that has dyslexia I started thinking maybe I have it too and it just wasn't diagnosed in those days. Oh yeah, I think in the arts is you know probably half the people in, that are in the arts as you are are um, dyslexic and you know it's one in five worldwide. Every, one in five people walking on this planet right now. Think about how many humans that are. That's and there's a, a spectrum. Some have it mildly, some have it profoundly. But still, it's, have you, can you think of something that affects one in five people that has gone so under the radar? It's, it's, it's and weird. And that the education system should be a little bit more helpful in that area. Yeah. But anyway, I yeah. want to talk a little bit about you because you're very interesting. Oh. And, um, you know, um, you do documentaries. And what I know about you, which is not very much, but um, I've noticed that you believe in causes. And there are some causes that you believe in that you make a documentary because it's personal too, that you've experienced it internally and you want to share it. And um, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about some of the documentaries and sure. maybe the health issues and where that yeah. one came um, from. Yeah. I, uh, well, it all, it all really did start with a, with a struggle with my health. Um, at age 15, I developed ulcerative colitis, and 2% of the people that have that condition, which is a gastrointestinal autoimmune disorder, um, developed the same situation in their liver. So by the time I was in my mid-20s, I was facing um, a fatal diagnosis without a liver transplant. Uh, that was in the late 80s. 
And um, how old were you then? I was 20, about 25 or so. So at the time, in my mind, when I heard that, I imagined myself sort of continuing a very limited life as a zombie, staggering through the world in a half human condition because it wasn't that common. Were you in a career of some sort? or? I was writing. I had gone to University of Colorado and got an undergraduate degree in literature and then an MA in literature at Northwestern and was uh, a correspondent for a magazine in Colorado and starting to screenwrite at the time. Um, so that's what I was doing professionally. But as you can imagine, we you know when you're, you're slowly dying basically, <laughs> Um, you know, that becomes your profession in a way, you know, so I was trying totally. to figure out how to stay alive and avoid a transplant, but by the mid-90s, it, it came around, and uh, luckily, um, it's miraculous, you know, I, I remember, uh, you know, it, it was a rough road, the first one didn't work, um, so were, I had to wait. Were you single then, or were you? No, I, my wife and I were married, and we had, our son was 18 months old, mm -hmm. so he came with us to Nebraska. Um, where I um, received a liver transplant. We were living in Denver at the time, mm -hmm. and that was the closest center of excellence for transplant. So um, it was a long, hard stretch for all of us. Um, my son spent six months in a homeward suites near the hospital. You know, those kinds of things are hard, and my wife, um, unfathomable that what she had to contend with, being essentially a single mother while taking care of you know, a single mother with two kids, because that's what I was for the time being. Right. So, you know, you go through, through something like that and you merge on the other side. And at some point in time, uh, you talk to any transplant recipient, they will describe a keen awareness that they're alive because of society, because there's this mechanism that's in place. There's a, there's a mechanism involving altruism of strangers, and there's a mechanism within the medical world that allows that altruism to keep people alive that would otherwise die. And it's an extraordinary thing to experience and see. And you don't really, unless you've been there, it's, it's hard to really describe how it shifts your perspective of the human experience. But it does. And so for me, um, I, was, I came out of that and I would watch television or go see movies or advertisement. And transplant was portrayed as an eerie science. Um, organs falling out of containers or so you had, um, you had two. Yeah. And you were lucky, two. lucky. Very lucky. You know, it was, a, it was an eight-month wait for the first one, and then I was hospitalized for four months waiting for the second one. So. And that whole Hulter. feeling of, like, who's, who's going to win? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it was, um, it was a hard time. I'm glad, but, you know, I'm glad I, you're I, here with us. I'm sorry? I'm glad you're here with yeah, us. Yeah, 20 years later this year. Wow, so. congratulations. Pretty amazing. But, you know, that, that this business of what you become aware of is um, when you feel it, it, and I think it has to do if you have storytelling in your blood, which I do, which runs in our family, goes back many generations. My dad's obviously the most well-known one. But, you know... Robert Redford, yes. for those that don't know. Yeah. Good guy. <laughs> um, you know... Uh, you see something, a, a mass misperception, and you feel compelled to do something about it. And my feeling was, everyone's making these sci-fi movies about organ donation and joke, dark black humor jokes on TV shows. Wow, like if anyone, has anyone stopped to understand the miracle of donation and the people that do it? What an amazing thing. So that led to my first documentary that aired on HBO in 2000 called The Kindness of Strangers. And the whole process of bringing that story out and being part of a, net, a community that's trying to bring that awareness to the public was really satisfying, it never really left me. And I became interested in applying my filmmaking skills towards uh, addressing issues that I felt just a, a pull to bring to a broader awareness. And of course, my timing was fortunate because with the onset of the online universe in the digital age, the ability to use stories and digital content to convey important message skyrocketed profoundly and so here we are in the golden age of storytelling, and I, I just feel so blessed, you know, to be doing what I'm doing. So tell me about a couple of other documentaries that you've done or you're going to do. Well, um, you know, I sort of work in, 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 right now, there's sort of three different areas. There's um, the whole business of toxic stress with children and what um, traumatic experiences in childhood do to 
derail you from a healthy life, really. And this is all centered around the emerging field of epigenetics, which looks at what you're predisposed to genetically and how your environment may or may not trigger some of those things. Your environment being your experiences. And so all the research, most of it coming from, well, some of the early research coming from Dr. Zanda and, and Felitti um, out of the CDC in San Diego, um, very clearly shows that children who suffer neglect, physical, sexual, verbal abuse, um, witness violence, um, or chronically exposed to mental health, uh, there's a whole list of very unfortunate sort of things that, that children are exposed to. The more they're exposed to these things at a young age, the more likely it is they're going to suffer serious health problems in their lifetime. Um, and that correlation, it's, it's sobering in some ways, but it also points to some things you can do about it and why it's so important to protect children and to, to try to intervene. And the, the difficult thing is there's a window there between ages zero to seven where these unfortunate experiences are occurring. But the impact of those experiences are not evident yet. They're not acting out. They're not having the health issues right, yet. Right. So it's very important to try and create a safe environment for children. And it's just yet another thing we all know anyway, right. that our children are our most precious resource. So, but there's really novel things going on in terms of how to deal with that and how understanding that the, how the brain processes those experiences. Well, it's the protection mode that kind of like locks a certain area to protect yourself from feeling. Right. And so you kind of close that area, and as a kid, you don't even you're not even aware you've shut down on a certain area just for self you know, to help to, just to help you through life survive. And what you just described, you can see on on functioning MRIs now. You can see what, oh. how the changes in the prefrontal cortex or the changes in the amygdala or the hippocampus shifts according to these experiences. So this is a physiological thing that happens to children. And next time, I mean, we all know that part of town you drive through and you see some kids and you go, wow, boy, I hope, you know, those, those poor kids are scary. You know, they're, they're pierced, they're tattooed, the hair, they're, they're crying out, um, and you just sort of repel. But the truth is, is that Every one of those kids has a really, really unfortunate story, and what you're seeing is really the tip of an iceberg that deserves help and understanding. You know, so we're working on on a project about about this to bring more medical knowledge to what we already know with common sense. We've got to do something about this. So that's, that's the most current thing. Yeah. Good. Um, and then uh, November 25th of this year, uh, we'll air on HBO a film called Toxic Hot Seat which um, is an amazing journey for me. I started in the winter of 2012, where I was approached by a board member of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Her name's Kirby Walker. She brought some research to me about flame retardants, that they don't work, they don't prevent fires, but they pose They're very toxic. significant health risks. Right. And the question is, what are they doing there? If it's really, if that's the truth, why have, are they in every American upholstered, piece of upholstered furniture, furniture for the most part? They get into your body and they, they, they go right into your fat cells. They, they, and then they stay there. They accumulate. Oh my gosh. So, you know, um, it's problematic and particularly hard on, on babies uh, because, uh, one, children are on the ground where the dust falls out of the upholstered furniture that has these chemicals. And two, nursing mothers, um, if, it's, if it's in their fat tissues, it comes out through breast milk. So there's, this sounds like, oh, no, not another depressing environmental issue. Oh, boy, God. you know, how much can we take? No, but, but it's helping people be aware of what they're putting in their own environment and with their children and what the cribs are. And Yeah. I mean, it's not and just organic food anymore. It's right. the crib and the environment and your carpets. and. But I do th see some things changing right now and it, it, it's exciting because when we were making this documentary exploring the issue of why these chemicals are there and of course it comes down to things like uh, legislative failures linked to very well-funded lobbyists on behalf of the chemical industry 
um, and, and the usual things that go on. There's a dark legacy that connects to the tobacco industry that said uh, they didn't want to make a fire safe cigarette because it's not as profitable. So let's fire pray, let's fireproof your world instead. So oh. an, another wonderful legacy from the tobacco industry here. But you know, um, the good news is that at the very same time this was going down, two very important things happened. The Chicago Tribune had been looking at this issue for a year, and they released a groundbreaking um, series in in the Tribune, exposing everything that's going on. It was so well researched um, and so well documented that it started a ball rolling in terms of awareness. That ball bumped up against something that was already happening in California, which was the pressure um, to change this standard called Technical Bullet 117 that insists that all these chemicals are in our furniture. It had been on the books for 38 years with no revision. And um, luckily, uh, Governor Jerry Brown and his administration, they had the ability to sidestep the log jams that were happening in Sacramento. And by administrative order, insist that this technical bulletin be revised so that we don't have to have these chemicals, flame retardants in our furniture. So while we were making the film, this all went down and we got to witness, you know, there, there's still some good people out there. Wow. There's great journalism, there's great citizen action, there's, there's great leaders politically, and this is, a, this is a positive story. So in 2014, and certainly by 2015, when you go to buy a new couch, um, if we've done our job creating awareness, you'll go in and say, you know what, I don't want the one right, with right. the chemicals. Give me the other one. So you have an iPhone app where you can scan, you know, what the retardants <laughs> are in this, like an organic food yeah. and, you know, what's really here behind the scenes. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's so much cancer in the world, too. And you yeah. start to wonder, where's the cancer really coming from? Yeah. You yeah. know, and Parkinson's and all these diseases. So. Definitely. I mean, again, it gets back to the interplay between your genetics and your environment. And um, right. we'll figure it out at some point. We're getting there. Thank I'm, you so yeah. much for doing this. I have one more thing I want to talk to you about. Um, let's see. What's olives and dirty martinis? Oh. <laughs> we're going to go there, huh? Yeah, we're going to go there. All Why right. not? All right. <laughs> so you have a band. I do. With a I brain do. scientist, a brain surgeon, I think, and, you know, <laughs> tell me a little bit about it. There's a, there's a part of you that, you know, there's the artist, and, yeah. you know, that's the other part of you that I wanted to share with our audience. Well, um, let's keep it in perspective. This is a bunch of friends um, that are all musicians that love to play and played in our youth and uh, have a real passion for playing rock and roll. So we put together a cover band. Uh, that covers mostly 60s and 70s, some 80s tunes. And uh, it's called Olive and the Dirty Martinis. And our lead singer is Stephanie Coyote, former film She's commissioner. She's got a great voice. She's I listened amazing. on uh, YouTube. And, um, and so she's our, our, she takes the brunt up at the, on the mic. And then the rest of us are an assorted group of uh, friends. And, and we all in, have our own lives going on outside the band and very involved in other things. But something we really enjoy, we come together once a week to practice and enjoy being together and we play out about once or twice a month at clubs and we'll do fundraisers and you know you want to hire us <laughs> or you can be on my tv show yeah yeah sure so do you practice yes. every night yes do you play every you i do play i can't keep for, my hands off any well that's guitars great around you want to pick one up now no no okay <laughs> we'll <laughs> have you pressure. on my show and then i'll show off yeah that way. Let's, let's leave it yeah. at that okay. give me a moment to collect myself <laughs> We'll play live. A couple of rehearsals. I don't blame you. And if you told me to dance right now, I would not do it. Anyway, this is really great. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audiences? Um, I would probably take the chance to mention that one of the other things I'm working on right now is helping reconnect the Colorado River to the ocean. Um, I have a project called Watershed through the Redford Center that's a nonprofit film company that I'm involved with as well. But the core issue is in 1922, um, there is a compact between seven western states and the northern state of, of, in Mexico to divvy up the river. Mm -hmm. You get this, we get that, you get this, we get that. And for the first, um, you know, 80, 70 years, it wasn't an issue because no one was fully exercising their, their legal rights. 
But as the, the population in the West has gone from 2 million to 20 million in the last 50 years. So they're still going on the old, old, old laws? From 1922. Wow. And so everything's changed population-wise and transportation-wise and usage-wise and industry-wise. Totally. More water, more water, more mm -hmm. water. The supply, if anything, has dwindled because of um, climate change. So we have an issue there and it's manifest itself in Mexico because since the late 90s the river has no longer flowed to the ocean and what used to be one of North America's most impressive and important wetlands for migratory routes for birds and there was a local economy and a local Native American community down there um, it just went away it just vanished and, and it's a desert now 10 million dollars would create enough water to restore the wetlands and you know double that and you have a river going into the ocean again well, um, if you think people, about $20 million, million dollars to solve an environmental problem you can see from the space shuttle, I think we can get there. I think so, too. So, you know, Watershed is a film. It's been in 40 film festivals, and there's been 200 community screenings, and we're working with a host of other nonprofits to activate the public to raise this money. And I think it's going to take, you know, organizations like the Nature Conservancy, Environmental Defense Fund, Sonoran Institute, the Mexican one, Pro Natura Noreste, um, other media organizations like Participant Media, we're all working together uh, to raise the money. And I think we're going to get there, and we're focusing particularly on making sure that the public knows that there's a problem, but also that we're going to fix it. But RaiseTheRiver.org is a great place to go and look at this if you want. If you care to watch us, we're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. That's and so, great. Another yeah. great cause. Thanks. Thank you so much You're for welcome. joining us. Lovely talking to you, getting oh, to know you. Enjoyed it too. And I hope everybody else at home will look into all these wonderful documentaries and have a heart as big as yours. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.